employer so she she's the first person who made me aware about the perils of a green card and she kept telling me that you know what eb2 is is has a lot of delay you need to start thinking about eb1 and she was on my case all the time and i'm like okay fine i'm just going to get you off my back and i'm going to get the eb1 done um so that was my motivation if you're thinking that i'll have like some intrinsic motivation that i was so far sighted that i took up the option no my 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 unfair advantage was a very type a sister and if you don't have your sisters who are type a and you don't have brothers who are type a i am here to i am here to be the type a person for you to let you know that it is time for us to start thinking about EB1 because EB2 is becoming trickier by the day. Now before I speak more about this I want to get a bit of a gauge where people are in the audience. So if you don't mind um then I encourage you to share your um your path in the US. Like if you're a student, uh if you don't mind sharing that. If you are if you have been working for a while, uh if you want to share that in the chat so I understand who is there in the audience and I'll speak to it accordingly so let's take a moment to to get a gauge of everybody over here thank you disha okay so f1 i'm a phd student here in the us on f1 post doc using f1 stem opt been working as a data scientist for four years on h1b okay L1 then H1B H1B have a 6 years experience filing an ad of you surely that's great that's awesome and if especially if you are on F1 and you're on this call like kudos to you because i didn't think about a green card up until like 6 years after my H1B i was posting till then so if you're on F1 and you're already here my gosh like i should learn things from you um so please take heart in the fact that you are you're starting at the right time i wish i could tell you that F1 is early but with the way things are going right now F1 is the right time to start so start thinking from now and i'm going to talk more about that that is you have a resource in your hands that when you get into h1 and h1b or l1 you lose that resource or that resource dwindles so how do you take advantage of that resource now if you are on uh, h1b i don't want to lose you you still have that so don't 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 just like you know fall from the call i'm like oh my gosh everything is sort of done i don't have any option no 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 i i did that uh, on an h1b so that's a little bit about myself in terms of who gave me the motivation now ranjit what how do you want to guide the conversation what else like how do we move on from yes. here yes i i i mean uh, i know that you know you are a professor actually and you have been a teacher yourself so i would like yeah. you to wear that cap as well i think let's start with what uh, i mean what has been uh, i think people we don't want to go into the basics of what eb1 means let's mm-hmm. start with the fact that you know uh, how did you go about it let's start with that actually and then okay. many people i'm sure will it will be a kind of story that they will be able to relate to and let's start with the criteria let's start with the eligibility let's start with uh, fulfilling the requirements section that might be a good okay, idea great. okay great all right so i put a i put a question on the chat which says on a scale of 1 to 10 how familiar are you with what is called eb1 Okay, so you have two, you have eight, you have seven, you have five. Vardhan, why? Vardhan, is that Vardhan? Vardhan has put a five. Vardhan, that is a very safe option. Is it a is it a six or is it a four? Very safe one. It's a five. It's a five. Why is it a five? Uh, because I am in my bachelor's currently and planning to pursue a master's or a PhD. I have not decided about that. Oh you so you're in India you're in India right yes. now? Yes. Oh yes. my gosh you're like 
you are far ahead in the game like you're playing on the bleachers my friend all right that's awesome okay so we have a, a, an equal, equal distribution of people on either side of the spectrum so you have a 5 you have a 2 and you have an 8 so in the interest of time i'm going to give you a very capsule version of what is eb1 and why should we think about that so eb1 is one way of getting a green card now if you are of the opinion that hey man i want to go to the us i want to spend 4 years over there because phd takes a long time in india which it does and i have all the intentions of coming back this is not the call for you so this is a great time for you to hop off however if you are of the disposition that okay i i'm taking a whole bunch of loans uh, i want to go to the us i want to work there for a couple of years and then i want to decide if i want to stay there or not and while i'm there i want to ease up the tension of myself to not deal with hassles of immigration so that's category 1 and category 2 is you know that you're going to come to the us and you're going to settle down over here whatever story you told the immigration officer that yes sir i'm going to come back that was a complete lie this call is for you right so if you want to stay here for a couple of years and you want to ease the immigration hassle on you or if you want to stay in the us for good that is when you start thinking about a green card if you're not thinking about staying over here if you don't belong to those good categories this is not for you so clear that now why should we go for eb1 there are three ways there are multiple ways of going for a green card but we as indians usually most often qualify for three categories first category second category and third category if you're getting a masters or a phd you're going to fall into the second category which is called employment based priority 2 now if you look at the nomenclature that you united states uh, immigration services uses eb2 is exceptional quality that is a good category to belong to if you're not from india because if you are from india then we fall victim of the 7% rule what is the 7% rule according to uscis if the population of a country is 100 and if all 100 people apply for a green card then only 7 people out of the 100 get a green card that is the 7% rule now 7% of serbia versus 7% of india there's a huge difference now if because we are from india and because a lot of people before us have already petitioned for their green card and have it approved they have clogged the line of eb2 and eb3 because of that right now the delay of getting a green card through those two categories despite being exceptional ability you're looking at multiple years rumor has it that it's over 100 years i don't know what the what don't quote me on that but it's it's long it's really really long just for reference you know uscis the priority date which means that people who had applied for their green card in 2014 were getting their petition looked into this year now that date regressed by 2 years because of the travel ban being lifted so you don't know how these things regress or in what speed uscis clears your application you're looking at at least another 10 years at least right so in order to get out of this hell hole this trap of dealing with uscis for god for sake a number of years that is why we are looking at eb1 that is the story behind why you want to go for eb1 is that clear so people who are at 4 are you at a 6 now sai are you at a 6 or vardhan or bharat okay 7.5 to 7 okay <laughs> deterioration for mr reddy um as i go through the topics hopefully you get more clarity so that is the reason why i was looking at an eb1 now why did i look for an eb1 like i mentioned in my uh, linkedin i i don't know if everybody is connected with me on linkedin or not but very recently i shared my timeline of getting my green card through the eb1 process 
I didn't really have to go for the EB1 process. I was well and good with EB2. And I'll tell you why I had to go through the EB1 process. And you're going to realize this as well. Because what you're going to soon realize is if you are familiar with what is a flowchart, you're going to understand that the if then else flowchart that USCIS follows in terms of immigration is extremely convoluted. And this is something that I learned firsthand. So a little backstory. Number one is I got my PhD in communication and then I got a job as a professor in New York City. I'm going to put my LinkedIn uh, in the chat at the end of this. So if you want to connect with me, happy to continue the conversation. So I got my uh, PhD, got into a job as a professor. And when I got into a job, I went into an H-1B, which did not even have to go through the lottery system. I thought that H-1B just had to be through the lottery, but no, it turns out that if you work in academia or if you work in any other nonprofit, you qualify for a cap exempt H-1B. So I just walked into an H-1B without having to do any work. The only work I had to do was get a PhD. So I did that. Uh, when I got uh, the job as a professor, the first three years I was posting on an H-1B, the first negotiation or the first, um, the first brush of me understanding that my employer does not really know anything about immigration and I have to advocate for myself came when I started my job at Pace University. I was supposed to start my job on 31st of August and it was like 20th of August and my H-1B had not yet come through. So I had to explain to the dean why they had to do premium processing and then they did premium processing and then I got my H-1B right on time. That gave me the idea that, hey, I cannot post on the knowledge of my dean in immigration policies, I have to be my own voice. So that's the first thing I want you to remember, that you have to be your own advocate. If you just have a lawyer from your employer, they may not always, despite them being called advocate, they might not be able to advocate for you. So you be your own advocate. So when I was at Pace University in 2015, around 2018, like I said, my sister started telling me about a green card i'm like did you ask your university to apply for a green card i'm like no i didn't and then i asked them can you please apply for my green card they did that they did the whole form dol everything that you need and they put me in the eb2 category because that's the default category that your university puts you in so i was put in that category in 2018 i talked with my university lawyer about eb1 she said aditi by that time, I had over 90 media media citations, and I'm talking about Huffington Post, I'm talking about The Telegraph, I'm talking about Time Magazine. That's because one of my research papers on online dating went super viral. And because of that, I was quoted by all these international organizations. Anything that you can think of, my research was quoted. So I thought I had a great chance of getting an EB1. Like, it would just be a, a walk in the park. So I went to my lawyer and I asked her that, hey, um, is it is it worthwhile for me to get an EB-1? And if so, what should be my profile? She said that either you don't have a good enough profile, you need this, this, this. And I said, okay, I'm going to get it ready by 2018 end. She said, oh, really? You're going to get like six publications by the end of 2018? I'm like, yeah, sure. Why wouldn't I? Delusional confidence of a 20-year-old. Um, and I walked out of that conversation knowing that I did not have enough, which brings me to my second point. If I ask you right now in the call, however qualified you are, even if you've gone to Harvard University, even if you have a PhD, there is always an underlying current that you're going to feel that you're not good enough. That's not true. The system is going to make you feel that you're not good enough. And you have to fight that feeling every single day. You have to wake up in the morning, come to terms with that voice that tells you in your head that you're not good enough, which can be echoed by your attorney, which can be echoed by USCIS. And you have to fight each and every day, put in the work each and every day to make that voice shut up. So that's the second point that I want you to remember. That voice of you not being good enough never goes away. You just have to reduce the volume by your work. So I started chipping. When I heard of this conversation, I started chipping through the qualifications that I needed to have for EB1. Now I knew that my university is going to pay for my lawyer as well as petition for my EB1 
after I contextualized the need of EB1 to my team in 2019. So I knew it that, okay, 2019 comes around. I have a surety from my university that they're going to petition for my EB1. They're going to pay the $5,000 that my lawyer has asked. All great. But I still did not start working toward my EB1. My citation count was 20. 40, I want to say in 2019, I still had two publications, that's it. And one of them was my dissertation. The other one I was still banking on, which went viral. I was paralyzed by fear because as a PhD, as a person who had a PhD, as I was submitting my papers to journals, I was getting rejected left, right and center. So I did not think that I qualified for EB1 even after my university said that I qualified for it. But you just have to go through the motions. You keep chipping in little by little by little by little. So by 2020, I had a good enough um, profile. Now, that was the time when COVID hit and the entire university was on lockdown. All the money was strapped. And the conversation that I had initiated in 2019 got stalled in 2020. And because I was still cowering with the fear that I was not good enough, I did not even initiate the conversation with my university dean. So 2009, 2020, November comes through. A friend of mine was talking about green card and I got really agitated. So I started the conversation again. This time around the university, paid for the lawyer, like gave the money to the lawyer. And I started working diligently with the lawyer. 2020 end comes through. My lawyer is asking for my papers, etc. By that time, I also had a book uh, uh, proposal accepted. So my book was going to come out in 2021. My profile was objectively stronger than what it was in 2019 or 2020 beginning. Somehow, the lawyer comes to 2021, and this is something that I'm telling you, so you understand the curveballs that, that you can experience as you go through EB1. It's not just you working. Sometimes the system is very non-compliant. So be ready for that, because I thought I was the only one going through that. Turns out I'm not. Sometimes lawyers can be your worst advocates, if not for your best. So 2021 January comes through, the lawyer has already started asking for papers. I'm very optimistic in my head. I'm like, okay, 2021, my profile is going to be submitted by February. I'm going to get my green card by November. I'm spending my birthday with my parents. I'm going to come home. January comes through, February comes through, March comes through, April comes through and have not heard back from my lawyer. In the meantime, I'm submitting everything that I have to her. I'm like, hi, Tres, uh, T uh, what was her name? Terry, uh, this is another publication that has come up. This is my book that has come up. I am I'm a journal uh, uh, reviewer for this. I'm sending her everything. So just don't hear anything from her. I go to the VP of HR and I tell him that, hey, what's up? I'm, I've not heard back from the lawyer. My mental health has taken a toll. I've not met my parents in two years. It's the pandemic is raging. I really don't know what to do. And from them, I hear by September 2021, the lawyer has not yet submitted my petition. And she sends a super scary message to me saying that our candidate does not have enough international acclaim. So she sends a report that she had worked with one of her clients where she said that this particular client was rejected by USCIS because they had 300 citations and they still were rejected because these citations were very inbred, which means people who you cite are citing you and vice versa. And you have created an echo chamber. And that's what this person is known as. Not many people know them. Then I'm like, OK, how do you build international acclaim? This was also around the time when I was publicizing my book. My book had just uh, reached uh, publication and I was supposed to get more blurbs for the book, etc. So I combined those two to build my international acclaim. I started reaching out to scholars across the world to get them to 
veto my book and that was one way that i got international acclaim so when you are and this is the third thing that happens to you necessity is truly the mother of invention when your back is against the wall your brain goes into overdrive your brain is going to fin- find out ways that you didn't even think of in your consciousness and that's exactly what happened to me because september october and november the amount of work that i put in to get international acclaim the amount of work that i put in creatively to figure out what i already have and how to milk that out to build my international acclaim that was something i'm very proud of so september october and november i plug in these missing pieces by december my lawyer puts together my 14 pound uh application in december 7th she puts in the application um i go to visit my friend in florida and we go to islands of adventure and i am watching grinch who stole christmas the musical and as the musical starts i get a message that my i140 has been accepted so that was the day i uh got my green card approved so that was my run to get the i140 from having 20 publications to ghosting of the lawyer to me getting my uh, i140 accepted uh on during christmas of 2021 and after that you do i485 and i got my green card in hand on april 7th uh sorry may 7th i think around that time april 7th or may 7th something of that sort but yeah that's my that's my story so that's wonderful uh, you know aditi it has it is really i mean at every moment of the time that of like your preparation you were being you know kind of reminding yourself of the goal that you were wanting to do now let me ask you a question uh, how in terms of your preparedness how much time would you have invested into this so my preparedness you know the thing about being prepared um you don't first of all i want to take a step back and i want to ease the pressure that we put on ourselves in terms of the term extraordinary like because think about it like eb2 is exceptional like getting a masters do you even consider that as exceptional in india like that's just something everybody has so these nomenclatures where we make it a personality trait right that oh my gosh i'm extraordinary yeah because like USCIS did not have any other term to demarcate us because god knows my parents are not calling me exceptional because i got a masters they're like okay now you're ordinary at best so please release this tension of yourself that i need to be extraordinary you need to demonstrate to USCIS that you are going to be a loss in court if they do not claim ownership of your brain can you do that because USCIS at the end of the day is serving a country that is extremely capitalist in nature if you can think money you can get an eb1 so make yourself indispensable for the country to lose you out i can tell you from myself that when i published my book and when i went to npr USA wants to claim ownership of my name as somebody from their country than an Indian from India going into NPR an Indian from India going to Washington Post can they claim ownership of your intellectual property think of it that way instead of thinking that you need to be number 1 or topper in your field we don't have to do that you just have to demonstrate to USCIS that if they lose ajay or if they lose lakshmi or if they lose salahuddin or if they lose nilesh their country is incurring a great loss if you can demonstrate that through the ten criteria you're golden so in terms of that when you are demonstrating that you are indispensable to a country your indispensability does not start when you hit the ground in the us your indispensability started when you were in india because you had to demonstrate a certain level of extraordinariness to even get through to the university that you got through and that's the first point that i wanted to share in the five step strategy that please do not discount all the work that you have already done in the us in 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 india and use that 
to bump up your profile in the US what can you use that you have done in India in terms of contacts you have made in terms of things you have won how can you use your pre-existing profile to demonstrate that extraordinariness never forget where you came from because you've done the work you're not starting from ground zero in the US you're starting from experience so that's what I would say Ranjit that when I built my extraordinariness or my profile it was not a one-shot thing I built it incrementally and that incremental building could be putting my name as a volunteer in a conference and then escalating up to the chair of a panel or getting my paper accepted at a conference because getting through a conference is much easier than getting through a journal. So you do it step by step instead of one huge thing and you're extraordinary overnight. That's not going to happen and that's not the right mentality to have. You know, that's, uh, I think, makes sense. In fact, a couple of uh, weeks ago, I was invited to a podcast, Aditi, and there I was asked, you know, what is extraordinary ability actually? Is it something being something superman or something a superwoman kind of a thing? <laughs> you know, that's what it looks like. Mm-hmm. I mean, we can go deep into that, but I think a, I think a very simple answer which I would like to which I gave there and I would like to repeat here is is neither this particular green card looks looks like there is something extraordinary about it or neither you getting it will make you extraordinary. That is the first thing. And uh, if you ask that what is truly extraordinary, it is simply doing ordinary things in an extraordinary way. I put it that way actually. So Mm -hmm. simple things as you rightly said, okay, you have have been a researcher, so you write something, go for citations, go what you need to do to make Mm -hmm. yourself more meaningful. I think, I, I mean, I'm putting it in a more simple and trying to be more elegant in this particular way actually. Mm-hmm. Do you think it's the right way or is it, it looks very simple, but I think that's what I feel uh, rather than making it too complex for people. Absolutely. And and like I said, the, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you two words, which uh, my then one of my PhD advisors, he said, I'm just going to put this in the chat. This is what we need to do. We need to maximize impact wherever you go maximize your impact and I'll give you an example so for the last stretch of my EB1 I decided to publish a book now publishing a book objectively takes more time than publishing a paper but if you publish a book then your name or your international stature is increased by the fact that the publisher with whom you publish will wire it to different countries. So because I published a book and because it was a research paper, my name was in Australia, my name was in the UK, my name was in India, my name was in Canada, my name was in USA, of course. So that's maximizing impact. If I have to do the work, I'm going to make sure that whatever I do gets me from zero to a hundred in the least amount of time. And this is something that you have to figure out on your own because you're going to get a whole bunch of advice. Let me tell you, please take one, take something that serves you and leave the rest on the table. The reason I'm telling you this is because when I decided to publish my paper, my co-author who is a professor at an R1 institute, and an R1 institute is something which you're talking about like Harvard University, that's an R1 institute. He said that, Aditi, do you really want to publish a book right now? Like, why don't you publish seven papers, build a body of research, and then publish a book? I'm like, bro, first of all, I don't want to be in academia for the longest time, right? And I want to maximize impact in the shortest amount of time. He did not have a green card goal. He had an academic goal, which was different from my goal. So you you know what you need to do in what amount of time and you create your own path. So that's what I would say, Ranjit, that whatever you do, how can you get the most amount of impact in the work that you're doing? Wonderful. I think that makes uh, things very elegant and nice, I would say, Aditi. I would like to open this forum for questions, actually, and we'll take off from there. Sounds so boring. there are a lot of people who are DM sending me DMs. So... Somebody is asking that when would we can we speak? So, can someone publish a book outside their areas of work or specialization? Let's say an MBA publishing about mindfulness. Aditi mm-hmm. would like this. Yes. So, when you are 
when you will be asked to demonstrate your extraordinariness you're going to be demonstrating it as a part of your major area so i think there could be a disconnect between you being a program manager and getting $300,000 and publishing in mindfulness a midway of that could be mindfulness in the corporate world see that's that's something that you can still sell it as a uh as a what do you call that expertise adjacent area rather than something that is completely straight out of left field does that make sense so think about your think about your profile very strategically that's another thing be very strategic in the way you think about it right so what what will what will increase the belie- believability that this person is exceptional in their field if you're showing exceptionalness in two fields it becomes really tricky find a way to marry those two and now you're talking i think that makes a lot of sense in fact what happens ajit is that many people whom uh, i would know that they are expert in their field but they are also invited to be judges in some events actually which may not be related to their field but since they are mm-hmm. expert at a larger scale mm-hmm. i mean to, just to give you a very uh, i mean a parallel example not exact let's say an actor being invited to a beauty pageant actually something like that yeah. so it, it's not you know but you are but because you are a great actor you are being invited there actually yeah. or you are a great uh, you know businessman or industrialist you are being invited so some so would for the purpose of eb1 would this help according to you I sold one such instance that way. I'll give you an example of what I did, and you can you can take it or you can leave it. Um, I work in the New York. Uh, I work in New York City. Uh, I live in the Greater New York area. And when I got a job in New York, I always wanted to. I'm I'm really big on extracurriculars. I like I like having fun. So the first uh, line of business for me after my visa was settled, after my employment was settled, was for me to figure out how do I socialize in this new place. I have no friends. So I reached out to <laughs> the the president of the Federation of Indian Associations in New York, New Jersey and Connecticut. And I got in touch with this gentleman and I said, "Hey, I really want to be a part of the community. I like MCing shows. Can you put me in touch with other people?" So one thing led to the other since 2015 we have had a beautiful relationship since then. And uh in 2018 uh they had international women's day in the consulate general of india now it's consulate general of india it's a big deal and they asked me to mc and i'm like okay listen this is federation of indian associations it's a big organization consulate of india consulate general of india not everybody's invited there that's also a big deal but this is not related to my area of expertise like how do i sell it i really want to sell it but how do i sell it So I requested a letter of recommendation from the president of the Federation of Indian Associations who said that we recognize Dr. Paul's expertise as a communication scholar and her prowess in interpersonal skills for which we invited her to be the MC of this organization or this or this event where all these other people were facilitated and like felicitated and other people included Chandrika Tandon who is Indira Nooyi's sister. So I knew I wanted that to be a part of my profile but I didn't know how but you find a way to connect it so find a way to connect it if even if it is not connected can you request a letter from the organizer attesting to the fact that because you have your expertise in this area they invited some eminent personalities from different fields and from this field it is you that they selected that makes a lot of sense actually yeah i think that answers the question also Uh, well, I'm opening. Uh, this is an open forum, so anybody wants to ask question, please uh, just shoot. Just unmute yourself, and you can start. Actually, hi, uh, Ranjit, and hi, Aditi. Uh, this is Salah Din here. Uh, thank you. Uh, it was really uh, a good conversation you initiated, but there are things which I really want. Uh, I'm a recent EB1 recipient. I met Aditi through a Slack channel, and that's how we were together. <laughs> but there is one important thing which i always believed the misconception about uh publishing a book publishing getting a patent out and there are things which i believe that for an extraordinary professor or researcher 
the elements which go into you being a author on a book which gets into micro publishing or anything else it's like a 15 or 20 years of your work so for me to be an author on a book is like my work of 100 or 50 publications has to be summarized in the form of a book where i talk about behavior neuroscience yeah but just to basically satisfy this eb1 category we don't need to get a book out of like 500 pages what we just need is good ideas like short communications editorials commentaries case reports everything sells over here so they are they just not like research paper or research manuscript which i believe that is the key for a publication but there are forms of uh editorials which can get out and there are easy low hanging fruits which anyone can cling on and start building their profile something everyone have to think about thank you absolutely and i and i completely agree with that and these are these are some of the things that that these these tips and bits line the weeds of academia right so if you are a phd student or if you are a master student these are things because salahuddin has been a professor he is he got salahuddin if i am not wrong did, did you get your eb1 as a postdoc no as a phd as a phd I yeah use, there you go i used my postdoctoral training as a launch pad to kind of get the eb1 approved and then move on to be an assistant professor just to carry yeah. on what i was doing earlier Yeah, and Salahuddin has been a part of. If if you don't know about the EV1 Slack channel, please uh, get in touch with me over LinkedIn. I'm happy to share that with you. I'm going to drop my LinkedIn um, profile over here. We have individuals like Salahuddin. We have individuals uh, like Somik. We have Shitij. These are all mentors. I'm there. Um, so instead of listening to just one. or person uh, you you get to listen to a whole bunch of individuals and again like you know ranjit everybody who's talking over here they have all earned their stripes and and like ranjit said with in in our in our call that even if you go with him if you go with somebody else go with someone right get the process started that's all we want you to do but if you would like to get more information about the eb1 slack channel that salah then was talking about i have put my profile in the chat please feel free to reach out i'll send you the uh, zoom link uh, sorry the the slack link but yeah going back to what salahuddin was saying that is you don't have to think big like you don't have to publish a book right if you now right now if you've gotten into this chat and you're like are yaar like you know i thought like publishing one paper would be good enough to publish a freaking book not really there are there are book reports that you can write there are short papers that you can write and trust me i i know this first hand because i'm a very lazy person i want to get the most amount of work done in the least amount of time so the first paper that went viral for me was a 3000 page paper and i had to get that done because my professor told me that i would be ousted from the phd program such were the dire straits but that 3000 page paper made the most impact in my research journey so it's not the number of pages that you publish it's the it's the individuality it's the uniqueness that you bring into the paper and the impact that you create with uh, uh, create with it so laudan is absolutely right you don't have to think big paper you can think about short papers you can think about book reports you can think about editorials and the list goes on jyot jyot antani aditi could you please comment on which 3 or 3.5 out of 4 out of the 10 eb1a criteria is satisfied and how okay this is a great time i told you that uh, the the uh, what is that flow chart of uh, united states immigration can put any machine learning algorithm to shame because it just keeps branching i did not go for the eb1a I went for EB one B. That is outstanding researcher slash professor. Even if I did go for the EB one A, out of the three or ten criteria, my my disposition was I will knock off as many as I can. I will knock off three for sure, and I will knock off another four slightly. So overall, I have a good profile, and that's what I would encourage you to do. Have three very strong ones, and then four subsidiary ones. So three should be a four point four out of four GPA. The other four should be at a solid like two point five or three. So you have some padding going on into into the profile. What I would encourage you to step away from 
is thinking that oh okay three out of ten done i am gucci like this i my ev1 is in in my bag things are getting tougher by the day so you might not want to think that i will do the least amount possible and okay i have three out of ten if i get a rejection i'm going to contest it the uscis officer is going to show you ten thousand reasons why you don't so please make sure that you have as many as it takes attitude have three very solid ones and three or four to pad it up with so that's a really, i think that's a very interesting perspective aditi because we did have around 8 to 10 other people actually and at least four to five of them felt that we should focus only on three and i would go totally by what you are suggesting that try as many as possible when i tried my even i applied for in fact uh, all eight actually i created nine panel so let me tell you there is a way in which you can uh, even if you are not an artist or other thing you have to kind of leverage that opportunity of the work that you do can be demonstrated in that particular manner so go for as many as you can yeah and and something that ranjit i i wouldn't sway too far away from other people what they said and like i said my 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 suggestion is not contrary to what they are saying my suggestion is have three which are rock solid so for me it was judging other people's work publishing my work and newspapers publishing about my work i had those three on locked and solid like those were unshakable the other couple of things like awards i did not have awards which were like grandiose i don't have a patent but i did have awards like i got the best paper award in international conference in like one international conference i got a research award which was internal to pace university so even if it's not a lot it's something right it's something think of your ev1 profile as a buffet think about it that way there are three items that need to be really good like chicken tandoori or like a good biryani or like a good like dessert and the rest can be chutput right i mean it can be like a good okay starter right but for you to walk away from the buffet thinking that oh that was a great buffet you need to have three winners that think about your profile like that i'm a big foodie so i'm going to give you some food examples wonderful nice analogy yeah any other question yeah i have a quick question anjit yes <laughs> thank you so much for the session first uh now we just discussed about 10 categories that uh, one has to look up to as a reference and uh, you know maybe a uh, strike off at least three to file for an application as someone that you know is like maybe as a kid <laughs> who doesn't even know like what those 10 categories are what would be a good place for me to start to even see am I, how far am i from those categories mm-hmm. can someone okay i'm going to drop this link if somebody gets to it before i do please by all means plunk the link in for bharat in the chat if not and if my internet complies i'll be able to share oh there you go there you go bharat oh there you go here straight from the horse's mouth uscis.gov extraordinary ability if you scroll down you're going to see the 10 categories that's a great question Let me just share my screen for this purpose so that uh, if yeah. guys want to see that that they can have a look at it so everybody will be able to see this right now so these are the like EB1 EB2 and EB3 so these are the if you are talking about for EB1 these are the 10 categories we have i'm sure many of you would have seen this so this is for EB2 and obviously this is this does not matter here yeah so these are the categories that you have to fulfill so here you yep. have to fulfill two of the six criteria here you have to fulfill three of the 10 criteria yeah it speaks about some award it speaks about membership in association it speaks about uh, something published about you judging now scientific scholarly or artistic or business related contribution remember this is uh, many people what we have seen it commit a mistake here if they contribute something to their organization they feel that is a business related contribution but it has to be business related contribution significant to the field not to your organization where you work for authorship in scholarly article there is a difference what i think we all understand what is scholarly articles it cannot be just a generic article so just mm-hmm. keep mindful of that artistic exhibition or showcases 
then performance of leading and critical role trust me guys each and every category we can have a one hour session on each one of them actually so it is that intense once you get into the mechanics of it so for the purpose of answering this question in this little session we are just giving you a glimpse of this but yeah. this is the link what aditi gave so this is oh, yeah. it actually does that help oh yeah yeah absolutely absolutely it's a good start thank you so much no, no absolutely yeah. absolutely okay i'm going to club these two questions together because we are running out of time aditi could you please discuss if there is specificity in terms of how many citations and reviews you would consider ready for ev1a or 1b have you had people from slack you want to collaborate and result in publications or anything that could enhance ev1 portfolio my friend raghav i am not the professor in that ev1 channel so they are not reporting back with that extra curricular activity or extra credit that they have done and i don't think i should ask them like how many people have i it's up to you i'm creating a channel and m- making it easier for people to find each other and i really do hope that somebody collaborates with someone from that channel because everybody is on the same board are you on the are you on the channel raga Where is Raghav? Raghav Vanga? Raghav is gone. He's asked a question on Pop Talks. Sorry, I was... Uh, oh, there you go. Okay. Pitching to the audio. Yes, uh, I, I'm not on there, but my twin brother... Uh, Your twin brother? Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> I put his name there. Uh, I already have my EB1B green card and now I'm citizenship oh, also. Wonderful. Uh, but I, want, I just wanted to see... because i see that there are a number of people with different backgrounds yes uh, i just thought uh, because he is in an industry where uh, publishing publications are not easy exactly. a lot of pro- proprietary exactly. stuff yeah i i can tell you this though i am i am actively working to make it more easy for people to find each other through slack i'll just take a little bit more time to figure out the mechanics on the back end uh, but for now it things are very skeletal but there is a way so if you if you join the slack community there is an excel sheet that i've created where people can put in their name their discipline and their linkedin and they also have a, a column where they say are you open to collaborate yes or no and people who have said yes please reach out to them and and start collaborating so this is something that i had in my in my notes today which i really wanted to share with you uh and i want to share this before i answer sathab these question that is if you are starting with the process and if you think that this is extremely messy like oh my gosh bharat you just learned about the 10 criteria and now you're going to start thinking about the nuances of the trend criteria and there will come a time where you're going to feel so overwhelmed you're going to think to yourself screw this i'm just going to wait for the 100 years for eb2 there will come a time like that you're not steering away from the path you are on the path so please please stick with it it gets overwhelming and that then a system arises it's like traffic in india it seems messy at first but think sort out eventually so please give yourself that time and if you are starting this process on your f1 then this is a great time for you to start because feel overwhelmed now so you can feel less overwhelmed later number 2 be very intentional about everything that you're doing that means things are not just going to start happening for you just like salahuddin said identify the lowest hanging fruit start putting in work over there publications count nobody has told you that 9000 word publications will count more than 3000 word publications if you can get a 3000 word publication in a journal with a higher impact factor versus a journal article with a low impact factor which is 9000 words why would you write the extra 6000 words does that make sense being intentional in terms of what raghav said that if i was his brother and if i'm in the industry and if i see i'm in machine learning and if i see there is a phd person or an assistant professor who's in machine learning i would i would tie up with them 
and I would see how I can use my industry expertise to further their academic journey whilst getting some of their academic credo on my end. So it's a win-win for both of us. So being intentional about all the steps that you're taking and number three is being proactive. Being proactive means shit is not going to happen to you. It's not going to happen to you. Nobody is just going to, trust me, I tried. I thought that after writing a book, people are just going to come to me and ask me, oh my gosh, Dr. Paul, can you please talk about your book? That did not happen. I had to send out pitches to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of podcasts and media pitches to get five. So you have to make shit happen, whether that means getting publications, whether that means getting into doors that gets you to be editors of a journal, you need to be extremely proactive in this journey. It's not going to come to you by following the ordinary path. Maybe that's what is extraordinary, not the result, but the effort that you need to put in. Perfect. Uh, Dikshit, you can ask question, please. Yeah, so uh, I wanted to ask one thing, Aditi, that... Uh, can we become uh, reviewers for articles in a journal without publishing any papers? Like because our work experience is good enough, we can send a resume off to an editor and ask him if we can be uh, a reviewer, especially if it's an up, up and coming field where there are not many people working. Yeah. Okay. Another. This is another rule that you must live by in this journey you first have to give something before you ask something i've had the same question that you asked me Dikshit, like yo i need to get in on this journal editor thing right so i did i did reach out and a lot of it hinges on the e email that you write so learn to write a strategic email learn to write a well-worded email learn to write a powerful yet humble email so that's what I did. I reached out to uh, the journal, uh, one of the journals, and I said, hi, Dr. So-and-so, I am this, this is my background. Uh, I am looking to increase my research portfolio. Um, what is the process of becoming a, uh, joining your editorial board? So start with a question, start with a sense of inquiry rather than a sense of imposition. So ask them what work needs to be done because you're asking something from them, but are you giving something in return? If the person says that, yeah, this is the process that you can follow, you need to review a couple of articles review those articles then because that is still a win-win for you because now you're becoming a judge you're becoming a judge for that journal and when you do become a part of the editorial board now you're authority but please let's learn to give before you ask something from them just keep that in mind and you're going to be gold i hope that answers your question Dikshit. yeah thank you and uh, uh i just wanted to ask one more question sorry yes. Yeah, yeah, please, please go ahead. Yeah. So, um, for working professionals, uh, um, we, uh, I think the low hanging fruit for us is uh, writing about our work on LinkedIn and making more connections and growing mm -hmm. our growing our social media presence. Mm -hmm. uh, that that feels like a low hanging fruit for working professionals who can't really put in the time and effort to write research papers, but they can write about their work on LinkedIn. So how is that, how is a good social media presence uh, going to support a case? Like, Yeah, uh, and that's a great question. I think Ranjit can comment on that because Ranjit, didn't you say that you had somebody who had a million followers come to you and say... Yeah, exactly. You no, know, I will tell you there are two things, uh, Dikshit here. First, uh, let me answer you in a more generic way, which would be uh, better the impact factor that you can demonstrate what happened by virtue of your publication and someone got benefited, you got good reviews about it. So that will definitely play a major role. Second, about online presence in, spe in specific in online presence, USCIS has recently come out with, uh, and many people have been asking me this actually, USCIS has specifically come up with a notification that uh, specifically states that online events and online participation in various initiatives would be considered for UB1 actually. So this has been a, I think, a latest about, uh, 
I think as uh, later, if I'm correct, it's I think uh, something in May June actually, or yeah. slightly around that time. If somebody wants, just write to us. I will send you the copy of that notification. That's just DM me on. I don't have it ready. Otherwise, I would have given you guys. Just DM me on LinkedIn, or uh, I mean, we'll just send it. Send it to you. That's not a big problem actually. I hope that answers your question. Yeah. I do want to share the profile of this person who I follow. Her name is Aishwarya Srinivasan. She, the way this woman has weaponized <laughs> her um, profile is commendable. Like I look up to Aishwarya so much. It's not just thinking that I'm going to share my expertise through LinkedIn. it's also the kind of opportunities linkedin can attract once you start putting value added content out there and look at what aishwarya has done she is a linkedin top voice she has 370000 followers she she puts out content again this is a great example of giving before asking it's because she has added so much value in terms of artificial intelligence that she has attracted this this following Now think about yourself as a capitalist country. Would you really want to lose out on a person like Ashwarya? You wouldn't. Like it's in your best interest to keep this person. Can you be? Can you demonstrate through different metrics that you are this person? And this again goes back to what um, Satabdi was talking about. That hey, like how many citations are enough? Well. how many citations show that you are an expert in your field right sometimes 20 citations matter sometimes 80 citations matter there there is no magic number i wish there was a magic number there is no magic number but how many citations go on to demonstrate that you have breadth and depth of your work i'll tell you my example i did not have many citations but the number of citations i had were from the field of human computer interaction were from the field of education were from the field of psychology were from the field of sociology so my work has relevance in four disciplines that's impact so citation is nothing but demonstrating your impact can you tell your story that my work has impact in breadth as well as in depth that's what you're going for I think I think there is a much deeper question here that we see being becoming an expert is a lifelong journey. I mean, no matter what. So I think I mean rather than just looking at the criteria, at what stage do we feel that okay, fine, we are good for EB one, and let's focus on the criteria as now. It's again, it goes back to like you know, three out of ten. If you have three solid, and you know for sure, I did not have three solid. I had three semi solid and four semi solid. So I had a lukewarm profile one of the lawyers said well i don't know why your original lawyer is keeping you on hold what you don't have in too much depth you have made it up in breadth right because i had fellowships etc everything and all that so it is a gut feeling right it's a gut feeling you'll know you'll know when you have done the work and the way you know how you've done the work is talking to more ev1 individuals now the good thing about being indian is that we are surrounded by other people who have their ev1 and the bad thing about surrounded by indians who have had their green card is because we belong to a homogenous crowd where you will constantly hear people saying i have 750000 citations i have these many papers i have 9 900 patents can i go for my eb1 green card like not only is the uscis government telling you you're not good enough you're looking at the category you you feel you're not good enough and then this gentleman or person is telling you that they have a stellar activity and you're like comparing yourselves with them and you're like oh my gosh never never can i get this that's the fault of talking to or or associating with a homogenous population go out there and talk to people who have varied backgrounds how have they cracked their eb1 i should you not and pardon my french there is a person of slovenian background who got her eb1 by being a happiness coach a happiness coach guys like and here you are worried that you have five patents and you cannot get an eb1 because the person sitting beside you has 10 like who is your point of comparison 
so there is power in knowing multiple stories so these sessions that you're going in this is a great start for you to figure out a realistic version of what an EB1 profile looks like. Don't get locked into thinking that this is just one category and one way of getting an EB1. No, there are multiple ways of getting EB1. I completely agree with you, Aditi. You know, I have seen, I have met over 40 to 50 people who have been EB1 achievers. And uh, each story has been very unique and different. And I have read about a lot of them. Just to give an example, a teacher from India just earning a salary of 50,000. Let me tell you, no citations, no publications, nothing gets an EB1. There are chefs who have got it without any education. Someone just put a question. I mean, uh, I was wanting to respond to that also. Like, you know, I'm a mechanical engineer and can I get this and, you know, am I fit? I always look at, uh, you know, let's keep EB1 journey aside for one sec, for some time at least. Try to become an expert in your field first. If you are truly an expert, then definitely EB1, you work, become an expert in such a manner that you don't have to chase EB1 actually, the EB1 would come to you. Look at it from that perspective. Now, of course, one can go a little deeper on what do you call something as an expert actually? Who On what is a pathway to become an expert? I always tell people that there are five pillars of becoming an expert actually. If you just keep that in mind, it will be clear. Be connected with some body of knowledge, that's the first thing. Whatever your expertise is, that you claim that you want to kind of contest for or want to be, be prepared for that some body of knowledge. It's a set of associations, you know, establishments, which are, there are several people who are doing PhDs on that actually, if you are not a PhD. Second is you need to be aware of what kind of associations or kind of awards exist for that particular expertise. The third is you should be aware of some kind of influencers and key spokesperson so for example if my expertise was is finance and investment and i may have you know kind of made billions of dollars but i don't know who is warren buffet what his, his investment style is what is value investment I, i'm not an expert you should be connected to that influencer and know about him he may not know you but you should know the fourth thing is you should be aware of the legal implications of that particular expertise if you say you are an ai expert but if you don't know what are the laws governing AI or if you say you're a cryptocurrency expert and you don't know the regulations and legal implications of, you know, any that particular expertise, you are no good. And last but not the least, you should be aware of certain journalists who write about your expertise. So just keep and if you see any successful people as CEOs in a company or anybody, they always connect with these five pillars, actually, that will make you an expert. And you have to just find your sweet spot at a particular point where you can just go for this three out of 10 criteria and just, you know, kind of go with a full kind of swing actually. And trust me, put a, put a sincere effort and it is not that challenging what Aditi said actually. There are yeah. people who have got it. Thanks. Yeah. Absolutely. Hope that answers everybody's question. Uh, questions. Thank you. Again. I think there is a last question, Aditi, that if someone yeah. writes or publishes articles to their local newspaper on few areas, yeah. I think, please, I think it's addressed to you. So you might like to take this. Um, okay. So this is the last question, right? Final question. Great. People should be writing about you. So I, if you're thinking of this as, okay, now it depends now which one are you, which criteria are you thinking about it? Are you thinking about this as your publication? Might not, right? Like writing in newspapers might not because it's not academic. Don't quote me on that. Ask a lawyer. That's another last thing that I'm going to say. This is None of this is legal advice. These are all things that we are talking about from our experience. So please make sure that you pad it with some legal advice. Um, in terms of you writing in a local newspaper, this, this happens a lot where there are uh, individual contributors to Forbes. That doesn't count. Somebody has to write about you. So this is, if you go to my profile on uh, LinkedIn, you'll be able to see in my featured section, there are people who have written about my work, uh, about the research that I have done. That's a valid example, uh, whether it be a local newspaper, whether it be an international newspaper, again, you have to show the impact of that newspaper. 
USCIA does not does not know about Prasar Bharati. You know about Prasar Bharati, so you tell USCIS about Prasar Bharati, right? We know it's a big deal. They don't know, so you have to contextualize that information as well. I hope that helps. But we can keep continue having these conversations. But again, uh, I do want to. Um, thank ranjit and i do want to applaud everybody over here um for for carving out time from on a sunday uh, and coming here and learning it's not the most comfortable conversations guys i i broke into cold sweats every time somebody spoke about eb1 trust me on that um but i am so glad that i went through it didn't stop went through the shit storm and came out on the other side and there is always hope for you and trust me when i say this it doesn't look like that right now but the us is lucky to have you um it's not you earning a green card but us earning the right to call you as their own so keep that in mind so thank you very much aditi and uh, thank you for your time and uh, thank you guys for you know sparing your sunday morning i know uh, well, aditi said that it shows your willingness and we are there to help you as much as possible and uh, this week again we will bring you another uh, eb one achiever on thursday you will hear about it soon and do join us and thank you aditi we look forward for long term association with you as well absolutely ranjit thank you so much bye bye take care you guys bye